Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Dane Menke. I am the Digital Marketing Manager here at Regenesis and Land Science. Before we get started with the webinar today, I have just a couple of administrative items to cover. Since we're trying to keep this under an hour, today's presentation will be conducted with the audience audio settings on mute. This will minimize unwanted background noise from the large number of participants joining us today. If you have a question, we encourage you to ask it using the question feature located on the webinar panel. We'll collect your questions and do our best to answer them at the end of the presentation. If we do not address your question, we'll make an effort to follow up with you after the webinar. We are recording this webinar and a link to the recording will be emailed to you once it is available. In order to continue to sponsor events that are of value and worthy of your time, we will be sending out a brief survey following the webinar to get your feedback. The topic of today's webinar will be environmental sequence stratigraphy. To give us insight into this topic, we are pleased to have with us today Rick Kramer, ESS practice lead at Burns and McDonald. Rick is a California licensed professional geologist with over 30 years of environmental experience and serves out of their Brea, California office. Rick has a bachelor's of science degree in geology from the University of the Pacific and a master's of science degree in geology from University of California, Davis. He began his professional career in the petroleum industry and pioneered the application of sequence stratigraphy to groundwater projects. We also have with us today, Craig Sandifer, Vice President of Remediation Applications Development at Regenesis. Craig Sandifer has more than 20 years of experience in the remediation industry and has developed much of the current product application capabilities at Regenesis. Mr. Sandifer was the focal point in the development of what are now commonly accepted direct push application protocols for delivery of electron acceptors like ORC Advanced, electron donors like HRC and 3D Microemulsion, and chemical oxidants like Regenox. Mr. Sandifer has successfully designed and implemented a wide range of in-situ remediation strategies on hundreds of projects and provides expertise in the areas of technical troubleshooting and field performance. All right, that concludes our introduction. So now I'll hand things over to Rick Kramer to get started. Thank you, Dane, and thank you all for your attention. So the, the overall um, thesis uh, and approach and what I'm gonna be talking about today is, is really about uh, what consider a paradigm shift in our in industry, environmental industry, and, and more of a, a focus on, on geology. And a subset of that is uh, environmental sequence stratigraphy. By that I mean this is focusing on uh, sedimentary aquifers. So generally in, in any sites that are underlain by sat, sand, silts, and clays. So that, that, that's just a, a general background is that's the focus. And as Dane mentioned, I'm a practice lead for our environmental sequence stratigraphy practice. But uh, all the work that you're gonna see here is, is primarily done by our, our lead stratigraphers. And that's Mike Schultz, who's out of our office in Concord and uh, Colin Plank, who's out of our Grand Rapids office. So this is an outline of what I'll present. Uh, first, uh, focus on geology then why environmental sequence stratigraphy, and then what is ESS, and then the main thing is to get to the case studies to, to show the application. So I'm starting off with a definition of geology, the science that deals with Earth's physical structure and subsurface, its history, and the processes that act on it. And my focus here is about the science of geology, and that's more than a boring log. It's more than just looking at um, uh, individual data that we collect. It's really about applying the science to interpret between and beyond where I, our data are. And, and that's where this uh, application of sequence stratigraphy comes in. And it's primarily, like I'll show you in a little bit, it's primarily about the practitioner, the trained stratigraphers. And the reason this is important for our, our groundwater projects is that the geology really is what defines the subsurface plumbing because it's dark down there. We have only limited amount of data to try and understand what's uh, the uncertainty of the, of the subsurface. And before I go too far in, into some of the details and bury the headlines, I just want to show uh, the, the takeaways from our, our case studies real quick. And that's, again, about this focus on the geology. 
you know, on the first that I'm going to show from Silicon Valley on the left, what you see is the original uh, conceptual site model, which did not focus on understanding depositional environments, which we're going to talk about, and the geology um, uh, impact or control on pathways. On the right, you'll see the geology-based CSM, which actually maps out the preferred pathways in the subsurface. And that was key for defining um, commingled plumes, the sources from commingled plumes. And the second that I'll show is uh, on the top, you see before our ESS analysis, there just was uh, a lot of uh, uh, lumping of understanding and uh, of the subsurface, whereas after ESS, we're able to define the details of, in this case, channel deposits, which helped to save like over $50 million in the uh, remediation uh, uh, design. So why ESS? I just gave a couple reasons right there, but it's about building an improved, more representative subsurface conceptual site management, about understanding the plumbing, and about better outcomes. And the way, main reason this ends up showing up in our projects, it, it really reduces, because we're able to reduce this unnecessary treatment of clean, unimpacted water, because we're able to better understand the contaminant migration pathways and target uh, the the the, uh, the mat, contaminated mass more effectively. Now, this is a paper that came out, a, a report that came out in 2013 from the National Research Council. And these were some of the results from that paper. And it really puts a spotlight on the importance of understanding the geology and the heterogeneity. The, this report said there are more than 126,000 sites contaminate groundwater sites to the U.S. that require remediation. And more than 10% of these, over 12,000, would be considered complex, which generally is saying that we're not going to be able to clean these to established endpoints due to it, the inherent geologic complexities. So right there, that puts a focus that, yeah, yes, we have been successful. There's a lot of sites that we've been able to take care of over the last 30 years. But those remaining complex sites uh, are still an issue. And it primarily has to do with the, com the, comp the complexity of the subsurface. And that focus evolved in, in a um, collaboration with EPA. So Mike Schultz and Colin Plank and I uh, are co-authors with Herb Levine from EPA Region 9 on this EPA technical issue paper on ESS as a be best practice for, for site management. And another one of our co-authors is, is Ken Eamon. So that's another outcome of this, uh, again, focus on, on geology. But now I'm going to talk about um, what our roots are in order for us to understand where we are now on how we look at the subsurface. You know, like, like any um, culture that's developed, you, you need to look at where it evolved from. Our industry evolved out of engineering, from engineering firms primarily, and also on the, on the hydrogeology side from groundwater production side. So that shows by the, the way we, uh, the standard for defining the subsurface, describing it is the Unified Soil Classification System, which is uh, an engineering uh, practice. It's, it defines the, the geotechnical and the soil, uh, 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 soil properties and does not focus on, ge on the geology itself. And then, like I mentioned, on the hydrogeology side, we evolved from uh, water supply industry, which we're talking about a whole different scale there. And that's where these assumptions of homogeneous and isotropic conditions, uh, they're, they're reasonable uh, assumptions to make. And that's also the case probably for thousands of those sites from that study. But when we're talking about the remaining complex sites that are still a problem and we're still having issue, you know, that's when we're, we're talking about uh, a need to better define the heterogeneity. So this is an example of our traditional products that we, more that's the standard in our industry for uh, defining the subsurface. What you see here is a cross-section where what's posted 
are the USCS strip logs, okay, unified soil classification strip logs. And the standard for, for our industry is to plot those logs and the, do what's called lithostratigraphic correlation. And that simply means to match up sands versus sands and the light colors are sands, the darks are silts and clays, all right? And what we show, what this shows, and this is one of our, this is our, from our first case study, is there's a lot of complexity and a lot of um, heterogeneity in the subsurface here. But the way we try and overcome that and get our arms around this so we could move forward is with, there we go. There we go. Okay, is we identify the best we can any continuous clay layers, okay? And identify those aquitards to separate and identify these, uh, 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 saturated zones. In this case, this shows it divided in zone A, B1, B2, B3. Okay. And then we take those zones and then we treat them as if they're, uh, they're homogeneous and isotropic. That we, we use that assumption. And that's, that's shown by the, the, and implied by the products that we use to define our, um, our, 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 our subsurface and groundwater. And they're primarily what you see on the left is we take uh, groundwater head equal potential surface map. So what we're doing here is we're mapping out these contours are uh, we plot uh, groundwater elevation data and then uh, contour that out. As we develop those contours or draw those contours, that's with this implied assumption of homogeneous conditions. Okay. And then based on that, we define a flow direction like you see with that blue arrow. And then what you see on the right is we then plot out the chemistry concentrations. And then based on that assumed flow direction, we then uh, plot out what's considered the contaminant plume. Okay. So that, that, again, that's with this simplifying assumption of homogeneous conditions. What this doesn't really take into account is the impacts that the geology may have in controlling contaminant flow. And that's the focus of what we're going to what we're going to talk about with ESS. What I'm going to get, I'm going to take you all on a little field trip here to show where we run into problems when we assume homogeneous conditions and basically ignore the aquifer heterogeneity. Where we are here, this is what you see is a is the photo is an outcrop in um, one of the most studied areas uh, outcrops in Canada because it's the hydrocarbon bearing. Uh, upper Cretaceous Horseshoe Canyon formation, right? Now, this had, these are sands and silts, and the, the sand bodies, the sand channels, those are the light colored rocks that you see there. The dark colored are your fine grained silts and clays, all right? And that circle that you see there, that's a geologist, a stratigrapher uh, climbing around the outcrop, mapping that out. And that's what, that's what stratigraphers do. That's what they uh, uh, study throughout the world is look at outcrops of different depositional environments that are shown on that black diagram. We'll see more a little later. But what I circled there is this is uh, buried sand channels. It's basically like a, a buried um, uh, uh, Mississippi River meandering stream deposit. All right. But now we're going to look a little closer at this. Blow it up a little. And what we see is, you know, and generally speaking, we're saying that these, these, uh, these deposits, these sediments are deposited from the bottom up. So basically you have that light, lighter colored sand unit. Those are the, the, the channel deposits. So that's coarser grain. That's where most of the water would flow through if that was saturated. And then in this case above it are the finer grain floodplain deposits, the silts and clays. All right. But what you, you, sh you need to point out here in this particular depositional environment, you see those thinner uh, clay layers in there. Those are, are actually uh, very aerially extensive, those clay layers, all right? They could be continuous on the order of tens of meters uh, to kilometers. And I'm just gonna show them here uh, to emphasize them. Yeah, there you see, okay? So in this depositional environment, uh, these sand bodies, the, the details of the sand bodies, is really they're not being deposited for, uh, layer cake from the, the bottom up. They're actually being deposited from the left of the page, left of the slide to the right of the slide. Okay, so that's a natural depositional slope 
that we're seeing that's emphasized or characterized by these continuous clay, the thin clay deposits, all right? And that's what's called, you know, even have a name for it. It's called lateral acc accretion of the, of, the, um, of, the sand, of the sand channel, all right? Now, let's say our site, our contaminated site is underlain by this depositional system, all right? And then we, I just showed there for, for the example is there's our, our groundwater table. And so everything beneath it, the sediments beneath it are saturated. Now, if we were to, to, to start working on that project, the first thing we start doing is, is try and collect some data, understand where our contamination is and how groundwater is flowing. So for an example, here's three monitoring wells that are screened in that sand. And our standard assumption is that's the first sand, saturated sand, that would be like the A sand. And we would assume that all those screens are in communication. However, a stratigrapher who understands the depositional environment, in this case, a meandering stream depositional environment, also understands that there's more to the details of how these sands are put together. So the stratigrapher would know to look for these continuous clay units, right? And this is the difference that in this situation, those, each of those wells are not in communication because of those continuous clay layers. So well one is not in communication with well two is not in communication with well three. So you could imagine that the impact that could have on a monitoring system, on a means for trying to define where your contaminants uh, migrating to, and then also uh, to the design. That's why we have these thousands of complex sites out there where we're, we're not getting success, we're not getting the closure, is we have these kind of complexities. In this depositional environment, what I show you here is the, the, the rule, not the exception. And this is something that, that a stratigrapher would, would look for knowing the depositional environment. Okay. So that's a little background on, on why ESS is important. Now I'm gonna talk about what environmental sequence stratigraphy is. So sequence stratigraphy is a science that was developed in the petroleum industry. And I like to think that the, the petroleum industry evolved very much like our industry has evolved. And what I mean by that is in the early days, um, all the, the geologists was responsible for was finding the oil and finding the reservoir. And the big, biggest challenge was at the surface, the facilities, the, how to engineer handling that. And it wasn't until these uh, decades later that these oil re reservoirs came in decline and started pumping water, then the economics of it was such that uh, we needed to understand the, uh, the, the stratigraphy, the geology. So that's when that industry, the petroleum industry, over the last several de couple decades has in invested billions of dollars in research and development on the stratigraphic control of fluid flows. That's basically what we're doing in our industry. And that's what we're talking about is you know, this, this initial assumption of homogeneous conditions that served a purpose to the degree that now with, with complex heterogeneous sites, we need to apply these more sophisticated uh, uh, analysis of our subsurface data. So what sequence, what environmental, so that's the science of sequence stratigraphy, which by the way, now that's the standard. That's what's taught in all of our schools um, as far as, uh, in geology courses, when you talk about stratigraphy, the focus is, um, is on, on sequence stratigraphy. Now, what environmental sequence stratigraphy is, is that's applying the concepts, uh, major concepts of depositional environment and facies analysis, which I'll talk about in a little bit, to the kind of data that we collect in our industry, okay? And it's generally the, uh, these three uh, components, all right? The first one we already talked about with that field trip I took you on, it's about the depositional environments. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The second piece is about leveraging the data that we have, the existing data that we've collected in a means that, uh, a format such that we could make interpretations away from the data points between and away. And then the, the last step is actually mapping out the permeability aquifer uh, architecture, actually mapping out the, the plumbing in the subsurface, okay? So what this is, is it's all about pattern recognition. I mentioned earlier about the importance of the practitioner. 
stratigraphers, sequence stratigraphers, trained stratigraphers have an encyclopedic knowledge of these depositional environments. And the best way to think about it is like a, a jigsaw puzzle. You know, if we did not have that cover of that puzzle to know that this was a scene on a lake with some sailboats, you know, for all we know, it could have just been a cat, then uh, we'd have a lot harder time putting the, those pieces together. Well, same with the limited data that we get for any site. We just have boring logs, just, and we don't even have all the pieces of the puzzle, right? But again, with stratigraphers, they, once they understand, once they determine what the depositional environment is, then they have an understanding of how the major sand bodies and clay bodies are put together in that system. They understand the geometries and the, the continuity and the dimensions of these sand bodies depending where they are, which, which system they're in and where they are in the system, okay? So that's the importance of the practitioner, of the, it has to do again with pattern recognition. Now what I'm gonna show you is the, the, the nexus, the, the relationship between the data that we have and this understanding of the depositional environments. So there's that block diagram I showed before that, that has uh, various depositional environments. What you see on the left are these grain size distributions, vertical grain size distributions, where the finer grain materials are plotted to the left, the coarser grain, like uh, coarse sands and gravels are plotted to the right. And what, what we're showing here is the major sand bodies in these different depositional systems, major sand bodies have characteristic vertical grain size patterns. So for instance, that's an alluvial fan, it has a coarsening upward sequence for the sand bodies that are mappable there. For meandering fluvial meandering river, that's a fining upward sequence. For braided river, braided fluvial, that's a blocky pattern. When we're talking about offshore, we have transgressive and regressive uh, uh, impact on the sand, and get and then for nearshore deltaic, that again. So this is a, an example of, of of a handful of depositional environments, and then again characteristic uh, vertical grain size patterns. Okay. And this, uh, just for your reference, um, colleague Mike Schultz, he actually wrote a part of the uh, ITRC guidance document on next generation Dean Apple characterization. And part of it includes this, uh, this table, which, which shows, like I mentioned, some characteristic dimensions of these sand bodies and uh, clay bodies in these depositional environments. So how does this connect to the data we have? So this approach, ESS, is about using all the projects we've, used, we've worked on. You know, for me, it's been hundreds since 1992 applying this application, applying ESS, have uh, been using existing data. It's usually in the form of boring logs, but CPT logs, geophysical logs. Now the direct push methods that we have, those are all, um, uh, they're all representative of vertical grain size distribution, all right? And that's, that's, the, uh, that's what we focus on. Because uh, there's been several stratigraphers and geologists who've come over from the oil industry before, but you know, so we've had that, that kind of expertise, but where things have fallen apart is this argument that, gee, all we have are these lousy USCS boring logs. They're not a geological description, not a geologic description of the subsurface. And then plus you get different geologists, different drilling methods, different sampling intervals. What, you what I'm showing there is, you know, the standard that we use usually in, in interpreting at, uh, uh, on cross sections, and that's a, a strip log of, of the unified soil classification system. But what we do in, with the ESS process is what we take that existing data and we format it uh, by preparing what I call graphic grain size logs. So this focus, what you see in the middle there is just like I mentioned on those other uh, uh, cur log curves, the finer grain clays are to the left, the coarser grain materials plot out to the right, all right? And this is the connection between depositional environment and being able to interpret uh, the data that we have and between and beyond the data that we have. So what you see is for this particular log, you see the graphic grain size log bars that are there. And now let's look at it a little closer. So you see that there's an upper SM, uh, silty sand, and that one is medium, find a medium grain, and a lower SM, which is find a coarse grain. So it plots out differently. 
okay? Because of the different grain size. So we're able to tease all the, the, these details out of existing uh, boring logs, all right? And now this is what we, so what the stratigrapher sees now is you look at that boring log, stratigrapher, first of all, this is March Air Force Base, and this is uh, buried sand channel deposits. So the major sand bodies are finding upward sequences. And what you see are two, from the bottom up, two finding upward sequences, two channel deposits. And these aren't just a one-off. It's able to correlate and, and actually um, uh, define uh, these, these channel, subsurface channel deposits. And these are the coarse grain uh, materials that groundwater primarily flows through and the primary pathways for contaminants. So it's really important to, to be able to map these out. And that's a, this is an example of the, the zone of impact and mapping out what you see in yellow. Uh, so actually in three dimensions, understanding the, the pathways, okay, the subsurface plumbing. And this, is, this slide is to make the point, the one on the left is using the same data using our more standard ES, uh, USCS approach of lithostratigraphic correlations. And as you can see, uh, you can't define the, the sand channels using that approach, all right? So basically, it, there's no way to map those out. So that so it shows that, you know, the, the limitations, uh, you know, if we're not applying this more you know, sophisticated analysis and have the right practitioner. So that, that's the basis of, of what it is. And now I'm gonna go through two case studies on where we have applied it. The first one is in the Silicon Valley and so this is a, a, a chlorinated, uh, chlorinated VOC impacted site. So basically like a solvents at a, a chips manufacturing company. And the, similar to what I showed before, the, the geology are buried stream channels, okay? And I already showed this. This is the original CSM and using um, more standard approach. And the, most of the contamination was in the B1 zone. So that's gonna be our focus, all right? Now what you see, that map, that map is uh, the kind of products that I showed you that's more the standard in our industry where the contours are groundwater elevation. Those white arrows show an estimate of what the flow direction is based on that. The white dot shows the on-site source area of contamination and the, the red um, uh, rectangle, that's the, the extent of the property of the uh, of our client, and the yellow dot is an offsite impact. The blue is the uh, concentration of. Oops, that is. There we go. The blue is a concentration of um, of TCE of the contaminant. The darker the blue, the greater the contamination. So at the five year review of this project, the EPA uh, said uh, that. Due to that increasing contamination at the down gradient boundary, where you see there that increasing VOC contamination, that uh, more source needed to be removed. Well, this is after the client had already invested the last 15 years in cleaning up the source, such that the immediate down gradient wells showed that, that it had been cleaned. But based on, on these results uh, and this understanding of the subsurface, there was more cleanup that was needed. Okay, so we took the same data applied these uh, approaches that I mentioned, our stratigrapher understanding that this is you know, buried um, uh, meandering stream channel deposits. That's what you see up top are the, um, the graphic grain size logs. What you see below is the interpretation of the, the sand channels, the sand bodies, which are in, in orange and, and yellow. And then the fine grain you know, silts and clays are in gray. And this is important because that area, that zone B1, that I talked about, it was able to actually map out two separate sand channels. One's called hydrostratigraphic unit one, HSU one is the shallower one, and HSU two is the, the deeper sand channel. And these were important because these were the channels that actually uh, in, uh, intersected uh, the, the source areas. And where HSU two, when you map that out and plan, you see it on the map above, it goes, trends through the offsite source area, and then to that monitoring well that's that's at the down gradient. What was con what con that is the down gradient property boundary. Okay, and again at uh, at the source area, onsite source area, they had done extensive remediation. On the offsite er source area, no remediation had been done. The onsite was uh, 
uh, bioremediation. So uh, there was a lot of um, uh, degradation and uh, vinyl chloride, for those of you familiar with that, was uh, one of the primary daughter products that's left behind. But at HSU2, no remediation was done, so there was no degradation of the TCE there. Now this, this shows the, the, the flow direction in the red arrows, but the point here is the, the map in the upper left, that shows the pathway of that uh, HSU1 and how that goes through the on-site source area. And the yellow that you see both in cross-section and up there, up in the map, is the, uh, the pathway of HSU2. And what we did then was we mapped out the chemistry uh, to actually be able to fingerprint uh, what the, the chemistry represented of the off-site versus on-site. And the, the primary uh, indicator was the on-site uh, impact had the vinyl chloride in it because of the remediation that happened. The off-site did not. And when you look at the details of where these wells are, 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 are screened, you end up seeing that those wells that are screened just in the upper HSU1, they have vinyl chloride in them. For those that are just screened in HSU2, vinyl chloride is absent. And when you get to the, the, that down gradient well, that was the point of concern, that's because they, because they um, treated that B1 zone as one homogeneous unit, they actually screened that monitoring well in both the upper and the lower uh, HSU1. So the, 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 what ha ended up being determined was the, the higher concentrations that was above the MCLs, that was coming from this offsite source. So we were able actually, actually able to map out the, the, uh, co the um, uh, pathways of these, from these different uh, sources. And that was already inferred and, and con considered just by looking at the chemistry data, but there wasn't compelling evidence because didn't understand the details of the pathway. It wasn't until after the ESS was done that we were able to uh, actually convince that. EPA was convinced and a client was no longer required to do any additional source remediation. So this just shows the difference from before and after. And now uh, my second case study is of a different scale. What you saw there that was uh, for the previous one, that was about a 10 acre site and we were looking at about uh, 60 feet of stratigraphy beneath the site, beneath uh, ground surface. Now this one's more like an, a thousand acre site and we're looking on more in the order of 600 feet of uh, geology beneath the sur subsurface. We were brought on in this project, they had already developed the remedial action plan and the initial design of what, what they were gonna do. The impact was primarily um, uh, perchlorate, but also uh, volatile organics as well. But the primary driver was the perchlorate because down gradient about a mile away from the source is where um, production wells were producing uh, perchlorate at um, above drinking water standards. So the client was responsible for wellhead treatment. So this, this particular uh, part of the remedy was about plume capture. So it required uh, installing extraction wells to contain the plume. And they already, what you see down below is the, that cross section, that was the, the uh, design, it was based, the design of the uh, extraction program was based on um, that um, uh, conceptual site model. We came in and first of all, our, our right away our stratigraphers knowing the depositional environment, in this case it was a braided stream environment, they understood that in these depositional environments you tend to have, um, uh, you, could, you could actually map out more detailed sand channels than what was lumped together in that original CSM. So this is the network of cross sections that were put together. Um, don't have time to go through the details of the geology, but this is just to show that they were able to uh, use this understanding of how these flood, finer grain floodplain deposits uh, are, are continuous in, in, the de in the area of, of deposition. And in this case, there's, there's a dip or a slope to this because this was next to, uh, near the uh, San Gabriel Fault. So that's actually structure that was there. But just getting to the bottom line, um, what our stratigraphers ended up being able to, to show is that you see in yellow, those are individual sand channels 
that, uh, that were uh, mapped out versus the green and blue are the finer grain floodplain deposits, okay? So, wrong line. So based on understanding the, where these detailed sand channels are, again, that's like the plumbing and where the, 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 the um, um, source was, we're then able to map out the pathways. Then we, once we had the geologic framework, then we were able to take the chemistry data and uh, plot it and apply it to understand how the, the, the contaminants were moving through the subsurface. And we also did a field program where we, understanding the stratigraphy, did very focused pumping tests to understand the communication of these different uh, sand channels between each other, okay? And this is the bottom line, that uh, the original design was 125 foot long screens for, for the extraction wells based on this conceptual site model. After using, again, the, the same existing data, applying ESS concepts, we define that the, the actual contaminants were uh, limited to just the upper 35 feet, the, the channels that were in the upper 35 feet. So when you do the, the calculations on an extraction system, it ends up that that original would be pumping more than 75% of the water that would be pumping would have been clean water, okay? And the results is uh, an over $50 million uh, cost savings on uh, a remedy on a, on a, uh, on a, uh, a 30 year uh, pump and treat system. So uh, that's the that's completion of, of case studies, but uh, I'm gonna wrap this up first by making some, some more general statements about the application. I mentioned a little difference in scale. The geology is totally scalable. For instance, this shows an example of a, a regional scale um, evaluation that was done at, a, at an Air Force facility. And so three general scales that we could think about. One is regional. Another is more the, the plume scale, like this shows here, focusing at the level of understanding uh, uh, the, the, the fate and transport of the contaminant in, in the sense of the plume. And then, like I showed in that case study, uh, remediation scale, focusing in on, on source areas and, and how to uh, uh, you know, cut the head off the snake and, and, um, and, and get rid of the, understand mass flux and get, get rid of most of the contaminant mass. And then it goes beyond that. Those of you who are familiar with the issues we run into with um, oh, uh, back diffusion, matrix diffusion. Well, this is from a, a, a petroleum publication from 2014. And, and this shows even to the point of uh, going from uh, what they call megascopic all the way to the microscopic. Those characteristics are related to depositional environments and different types of facies models, okay? So my point here is even when we, when we, when we might need uh, high resolution site characterization to define some of these higher resolution issues, once we, we do that, um, or even before, we can actually map out where these kinds of um, uh, conditions may be uh, using existing data and then use high res characterization, be able to develop a more uh, focused, targeted, a program for collecting high-res data. And this, this is, uh, slide is mainly to show that the application of ESS is done regardless where you are on the remediation life cycle from site characterization, remediation design, uh, implementation, and all the way to site closure. You know, all those little bubbles are uh, pieces or parts of those uh, life cycle that are impacted by heterogeneity, okay? And, and especially when we're talking at the end, about the end product, trying to convince uh, regulatory agencies that it's, you know, we know enough that, you know, we could, we could, uh, we've cleaned up the site or we, we've met uh, the requirements. A lot of that is about understanding the uncertainties and the heterogeneities. So these are, Highlights um, that environmental sequence stratigraphy is, uses existing data. So it, we don't need new data, but we're scientists. So there are more, you know, more data is gonna be collected than all the better. But the point is, 
what you want to do is optimize what you have with the existing data, and then we could help to uh, uh, high grade any data gaps analysis. And then also it's applicable to all contaminant types because this is about defining the plumbing. So it doesn't matter what uh, impact is moving through groundwater. So we've, we've applied it to all, all of those um, contaminants that you see there. Uh, I already talked about the variety of scales and critical to all phases of the remediation. And then it's, it's considered a, an emerging best practice. I mentioned uh, about the US EPA paper that was uh, published just uh, a couple months ago. And then uh, before, just before I hand off to Craig, I just wanna show this off too. This is about moving forward, how we collect data. I mentioned it's this focus on, on geology and we like to call it now remediation geology. There's gonna be a, a, a technical session at this year's Patel that Herb Levine and I are, are co um, session chairs on remediation geology. And one of the things that was presented at the last uh, Battelle conference is this um, uh, better approach to, I mentioned uh, versus the USCS, is borehole geologic logs. And this is a collaboration with, you know, some of our folks, Mike Schultz and Colin Plank, as well as Murray Einerson, Jessica Meyer of University of Guelph as well, um, have helped with it, develop this. That's that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. It was a wonderful job and technical transfer. Um, this is Craig Sandifer, and I'm going to talk about design verification. Um, as many of you might know that our Regenesis um, customers, uh, we've been proposing design verifications now for a couple of years. This was uh, based on the notion that we step back and look at our, our designs and, and find that there are reasons, there are themes as to why performance isn't occurring as we anticipate based on our designs and, and the remedial outcomes. So what I'm going to talk about real briefly today is kind of what you as a remediation practitioner would need to know to do a design verification and to improve your site's outcome. Um, to to uh, coin the term why stratigraphy rules, I wonder now if it if it might not be Rick uh, why heterogeneity rules remediation might be a better term. So I'm going to give you a few terms uh, to better understand geologic conditions, and then I'm going to summarize uh, a design verification program uh, set of of sites that we've been following for a while give you some updates. So what do you need to know as a practitioner? Well, as Rick's been discussing and Mike Schultz and his group are all talking about is organization and position of contaminant storage units and transport units. And, and this comes from whether it's fine grain, I'm calling a storage unit and, or a coarse grain unit, I'm calling a transport unit. But these vertical and lateral relationships between storage and transport units or fine grain, coarse grain are critical. They're need to know. As, as Rick has so eloquently described in the previous slides. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say in most situations that we work for our customers as design, remediation designers at Regenesis, we care about where the sand is. How much of it, how well sorted, and what's its position in relation to the fine grain unit. So Rick's talked about this in great detail, and I will not overemphasize it here, but these sedimentary processes control these relationships. Um, they're organized, they may appear random, but they're not, and they are card cataloged by depositional environment facies analyses. Once we're in that, the correct area, we can start to be somewhat predictive, and we can also be predictive as to the organization of these fine and coarse grain units. So since sedimentary processes control these relationships, the mass storage and distribution of, of contaminants and the ultimate shape of the contaminant plume is a result of this heterogeneity or this organization or, or in relationship. Um, 
since contamination is distributed by soil and positional relationships of those soil types, identifying the vertical and lateral relationships to, between these low and high K zones are very critical. And so essentially your site and the scalability that Rick talked about, whether it's a smaller site or a larger site, this is what makes remedial designs from our perspective site specific specifically hydraulic connectivity and those positional relationships. So segueing and well, how do, can I better understand that? I mean, Rick's come at it from a very um, detailed view. Um, the remediation designers at Regenesis have, have conferred for a long time on what do we need to know? How do we make remediation better? Now, if we had some of Rick's information and we had some of those great site conceptual models it would make our lives a lot easier. But on a lot of the sites we look at, we don't have that level of de detail. So design verification was developed to, to, to cover off on technical gaps. These are pre-application field verifications of the design assumptions we're making. They're usually localized and fairly high density, and they focus on contaminant transport zones, unless you might be in a source area. Most of the time, we're in the body of the plant. So our objective is to improve reagent and placement accuracy and ID and target the mass flux zones. So if you believe the practitioners out there right now, most of them are saying typically 10% of the aquifer is controlling about 90% of the contaminant mass distribution. So if you can nail that down, you go a long ways in knocking your plume body down considerably for a much lower cost. So what is design verification? I've told you kind of a little bit what it does, what it's not. It's not more of the same, folks. It's not delineating the lateral and vertical extent, defining plume boundaries, receptor pathways, or liability and risk. What it is, it improves remedial outcomes, and that's by focusing on identification, identification of the position of high contaminant mass and the associated mass flux zones. We emphasize identification of the principally impacted units resulting in better reagent contaminant contact. We don't sweat the 5% that doesn't matter. We sweat the 10% that really matters, the 90% conduit. So design verification is designed to aid us as a designer to ID these technical blind spots, and I'll talk about them in a, in a slide. It refines our design assumption. It helps, it fits within the site conceptual model. It dovetails with site conceptual models. It helps us reag with reagent selection. It helps us also calibrate reagent design. So is my mass of contaminant marrying up with the volumes and mass of the reagent that I'm, remedial solution that I'm proposing? Or better, bigger question is can I actually fit the remedial reagent volumes in the target treatment zone. A lot of folks miss that boat sometimes, and we end up putting more reagent on the ground than in the ground. So this allows us to kind of calibrate target treatment zone accommodation rates and volumes and ID those hydraulic limitations. One of the things we like, and Rick is, is a big proponent of, and I, I've, I've conferred with him often on this, is continuous core logging. I, Recording these soil types using, and I stress this, geologically based descriptions is incredibly important. Um, I don't know if you could see on, on, on Rick's um, uh, poster, but he, he has a whole section on um, settling tubes. We like to look at uh, contaminants of concern lab analysis when it's necessary, when we see high hits on the FID or the PID, clear water injection, we're going to talk a little bit about that. And we've also added sieve analysis. We think that has some merit and, and it's a, a low cost um, analysis. So I'm going to talk about a few of the parameters that I think are really critical for people to understand and, and to start using. It's a, a, a soil settling tube. It's a field technique. It's semi-quantitative. And to a, it, with a trained field geologist can be very accurate. It's a visual determination. It gives a relative soil particle size. It helps to find sand silts and clays. It helps to find the sands in the ways that geologists need to understand them. That is relative grain size, how well sorted it might be. It's simple, 
It's reasonably real, reliable and rapid. And in my opinion, it decreases subjectivity to a great deal, in, especially in those mixed up uh, transitional zones that are silty sandy or silty clay sands. Helps a lot. If you look at the right, you can see clay, silt, sand, fine sand, and coarse ground all represented in a single settling tube. It's pretty easy to relatively figure out, hey, I've got fine coarse sand with some clays and silts. It can, be, uh, it can be fairly high density. You can do these relatively inexpensively, one foot intervals or where you see the big transition zones. The clear water injection test is a second method that we use extensively. It helps us document the acceptance rates and volumes. So that's specific to the vertical target treatment zone that we're interested in treating. It assists in application decisions it, for instance, if we're using direct push injection techniques, do we want to go top down or do we go to want to go bottom up? It also helps with injection wells. It helps us define the screen intervals better. Data collection often differs. The data that we collect from this often differs greatly from the hydraulic, the KH-based reagent volumes estimate we're given on our, our our project evaluation sheets. So we often see a, a, a fairly large disparity between what we calculated and what we actually were able to achieve. Finally, I want to address technical blind spots. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where Regenesis and our technical team feel a lot of pain because technical blind spots are blind spots. You don't know them until you define them. You may think you know them, but a lot of times you don't. When we perform design verification, 46% of the time we find unidentified hydrogeologic conditions. That's a lot. Lower injection rates, 25% of the time, or decreased ROIs than what we anticipated. Unidentified contaminant transport zones, 21% of the time. That means 21% of the time, there's a I, there's a transport unit that hasn't doesn't show up on logs. 18% uh, of the time we see a thicker contaminant zone, but I think it's very important. 18% of the time we see a higher contaminant concentration than was anticipated. And I can tell you that most of the time, the higher contaminant concentration comes from the notion that you used groundwater data to do a remedial design and you don't take in consideration the soil mass banked on the surface of soils. So in fine, my final slide is simply design verification. It fits within good site conceptual, site conceptual model uh, definitions and, 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 and should be used in concert with a good site conceptual model. It helps refine that site conceptual model to very specific remedial objectives. It, it helps us refine our design assumptions. It calibrates and helps us select reagent selection or make reagent selections. Maybe it isn't ISCO after you do this. Maybe it is ERD. Um, helps us calibrate the remedial design in terms of mass versus reagent, contaminant mass versus reagent mass. And, and the old question, can we fit what we think we can into the target treatment zone? Finally, you know, a critical piece is calibrating that target treatment zone's accommodation rates and volumes. How fast do I need to pump it to keep integrity of the aquifer without fracking? And how much can I get in? With that, I'll conclude. I appreciate people's time. We'll take some questions. All right. Uh, thanks, Craig. Yeah, that's going to conclude the formal section of the presentation. So at this point, we'd like to shift into the Q&A portion. Uh, before we do this, uh, just a few quick Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and circle back to the questions. We have a lot of questions today, so if we do run out of time before your question, uh, 
uh, we'll follow up with you after the webinar. All right, so here we go. Uh, first question is, I've come to think we should map a site's stratigraphy before installing wells. The mistakes ESS are trying to solve seem related to this thought. Should we be looking in, to revise our approach to investigations to map then sample? Yeah, great question. Um, yes, that, uh, that goes to uh, the first steps that I show in the approach of environmental sequence stratigraphy and uh, the comment about the importance of the practitioner. So whenever Mike and Colin are working on a project, the first thing they do is to look at Google Earth, understand you know, what the surface depositional surface geology is like, and then they go look at uh, research, existing reports and publications, typically USGS, that has uh, uh, interpretations of what the geology and the depositional uh, environments are that they're, that they're dealing with. And once, you know, Stratigra forgets that, they've already got a model in mind. It's like that, that example I showed of the jigsaw puzzle. So as soon as they know the depositional environments, they already uh, understand uh, something about the, the kind of sand bodies that they're going to interact, what kind of um, uh, data they're going to be looking for in the, the boring logs, the actual site data. And so the, the model's already been put together in a sense, the conceptual model, before they even start looking at the, the existing data, okay? So I think that ad addressed the, the question is definitely, that's, if we were starting a new project today, uh, that's the first thing you, you want to do is uh, first get an understanding of depositional, mo depositional environment uh, and have your stratigrapher you know, identify where you might expect you know, to, to define where the major sand bodies are, the major, um, where, where the best area is. For instance, if it is a, a stream deposit, you know, understanding generally what is the orientation of uh, the, the stream channels. All right. Okay, great. Uh, next question here is, uh, during subsurface site investigations, I imagine you strongly recommend conducting grain size analyses on every sample, correct? Uh, if so, at what intervals? Uh, continuous, every two feet, every five feet, what are your thoughts and recommendations? Yes, grain size is, is critical. That's, like I mentioned, the focus is when we have, when we're limited to the data that's already available, we focus on developing these vertical grain size, um, um, uh, graphic grain size logs. So as the, our, our, our poster shows, uh, and that, that's going to be presented, I believe, as a, a learning lab at this year's Battelle, uh, that no, uh, we don't necessarily recommend that you go out and do you know, sieve analysis uh, uh, to that degree. It's like, I think what, what Greg was showing, um, I'm sorry, what Craig was showing, uh, using things like the settling tubes, still making field calls on, on grain size is, is, is a good thing. Uh, but also, depending on your depth of investigation and the kinds of materials, you know, what's ideal to our other more continuous, um, maybe call them objective uh, uh, sampling uh, or uh, uh, devices like uh, direct push using, uh, for instance, a cone penetrometer test, a, a CPT or geophysical logs. Those are, are very uh, important, very good, a good, more inexpensive way to get continuous data. But having said that, that's providing you have some continuous cores that you take in order to, to calibrate those logs. So getting back to that, no, it's, um, uh, it, the importance is not to um, understand grain size like you would need for a geotechnical study. It's really, for the stratigrapher, it's mainly understanding what the uh, vertical grain size pattern is because that's equated to the energy of the depositional system. So a stratigrapher is not particularly um, uh, concentrating or needing the, um, the absolute grain size designation, just mainly understanding relative. So that's why things like uh, CPT and geophysical logs are, are really good tools for, for stratigraphic analysis. 
Yeah, great. I think we probably have time for one more question. Uh, this person says uh, he does a lot of phaeton transport modeling and has uh, worked with Colin Plank before. Uh, is there a way to map these ESS facies into a type of numerical model, grid or unstructured grid? Oh yeah, that, yeah, that's a good question. Now, so I was focusing on the geology, of course, but what's really important is linking that to the, to the hydrogeology and how you're going to design and engineer systems. So, you know, I, so yeah, this focus on, on geology and what we call the, the lithophases of what I mean by that is of saying these, these sand bodies, sand channels that we we're showing versus floodplain. These different lithophases, these uh, different uh, sedimentary bodies that we, that we map out, they do have uh, you know, representative range in hydraulic conductivity. So you could, you could say that uh, we can use the, this ESS uh, mapping out of the, of the subsurface in 3D as a proxy for hydraulic conductivity. So that we can do that, run some tests to define um, field tests as well to define relative hydro, uh, hydraulic conductivity. So then these can, uh, the mapping in geology and the geology would then be very valuable to groundwater modelers for representing that um, in, in groundwater models. All right, great. Thank you very much, Rick. So that's going to be the end of our chat questions. If we did not get to your questions, someone will make an effort to follow up with you. If you'd like more information about the services offered by Burns and McDonald, please visit burnsmcd.com. If you need immediate assistance with a remediation solution from Regenesis, please visit regenesis.com to find your local technical representative, and they will be happy to speak with you. Thanks again very much to Rick Kramer and Craig Sandifer. And thanks to everyone who could join us. Have a great day.